Good evening. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. We've been getting a lot of emails at Fairwinds on, on many topics, but one topic's generated an awful lot of questions and concerns and, and some really thoughtful remarks, and that's what happened at Unit 3? Why did that explode the way it did compared to Unit 1 and all the other reactors on site? So today I want to use that, the opportunity to talk about uh, what we know for sure about Unit 3 and, and uh, a couple theories about what could have caused the, uh, the, the devastation we see at Unit 3. Well, to begin with, the Unit 3 explosion is much more dramatic than the Unit 1 explosion. Now, engineers have a term called detonation, and they have a separate term called deflagration. What that means is they're both explosions to, to, in, in lay terms, but a deflagration is when the, the wave, the shock wave, travels at the speed of sound. A detonation is when the shock wave travels faster than the speed of sound. And a detonation is much more damaging than a deflagration. So that may seem like a technical nuance, but it's really the difference between what happened on Unit 1 and what happened on Unit 3. If you look at the plume that was generated at Unit 1, it kind of moves away from the building at a much more leisurely pace than, the, um, th than, than what happened at Unit 3. And I'd like to go into a couple things we know for sure about Unit 3 and then postulate uh, the, the reason why I believe it happened. Well, first off, it's obviously a much more massive explosion than Unit 1. The second thing is that there's a large amount of energy that goes straight up. And we would call that a, a, a vector. There's an upward vector on Unit 3 that Unit 1 doesn't have. And that's an important clue here we'll get to in a minute. The next thing is that it's clear in Unit 3 that there's a, an explosion. If you look at the south side of the building, that's the right side of the building, there's a bright yellow flash before the, the black smoke begins to go upward. That's another important clue we'll get to in a minute. Well, the other thing is that fuel rods were discovered, pieces of nuclear fuel rods were discovered as far away as two miles from the plant. Now, if you look at Unit 4, which we've talked about in the past, the fuel rods are dry, but the fuel racks are intact. So it's really unlikely that nuclear fuel rods could be thrown from the Unit 4 pool a couple miles away, which leads us to the fact that the fuel that's been found off-site had to come from Unit 3. Well, the other things that have been discovered is that um, uranium, as a, as a very fine dust, has been found in Hawaii and on the West Coast. Plutonium has been found on the site as a very fine powdery dust. And, and another element called americium has been found in New England. Well, all of those are, are what we call transuranics. They're heavier than uranium. And that's an indication of a, uh, uh, that, that nuclear fuel was damaged and that nuclear fuel was volatilized at Fukushima. The, the other things are that the um, photographs of Unit 3 after the explosion indicate that a large portion of the building is missing, especially on the south side. But yet the infrared picture of the same building shows a heat source still on the south side. Well, last but not least is that we're sure, the, the, the data indicates that the containment itself and the reactor itself on Unit 3 remain intact. So we've got a mystery here. We've got a reactor and a containment intact, but we know the building was blown to smithereens. Why? I believe that the fuel pool, which is a large 50 by 50 by 50 feet deep container, was empty. And it filled with gases and blew upward. Now the top of that pool would be open, the sides would prevent, would, would be a barrier, and that could be the, the cause of that upward projection of material. Now that accounts for a couple more things. 
But basically what I'm saying is that the fuel pool is like the muzzle of a gun. It was pointing upward and it blew upward. And the other thing is if you look at the photos, there's an awful lot of rubble coming back down. Now that's fuel racks, fuel rods, and, uh, and pieces of uranium and plutonium. So that accounts for the fact that uranium and plutonium were found as far away as a couple miles off site. The other thing it shows is that the, um, uh, it, the blackness of that cloud indicates that uranium and plutonium were volatilized. In other words, they were turned into a really fine aerosol which can find its way across the Pacific uh, in Hawaii and on the West Coast and, and now here in New England as well. So here's the question. What caused that upward force? Well, if it were just hydrogen, a hydrogen-oxygen reaction would create water. And when that happens, the sound wave travels at the speed of sound, and it's a deflagration. That's what happened in Unit 1. It's, it, it's dramatic, but it's not explosive. What caused the explosion in Unit 3? Clearly there was an explosion for two reasons. One is the magnitude of the plume moving upward, and the other reason is the, the red flash on the side of a building. A deflagration doesn't give a red flash like that. A detonation does. So the question is, what caused the detonation? A hydrogen-oxygen reaction alone won't do it. There has to be something more here. And the, the jury is still out on why. But a plausible reason is that a hydrogen reaction started, which then caused a shock wave to move and distort the nuclear fuel in the pool. The distortion of the nuclear fuel in the pool creates a prompt nuclear reaction, which then blows the rubble out of the pool up in the plume and creates the energy needed to create the dramatic, uh, the dramatic event that we've seen at Fukushima Unit 3. The, there is a way to test this hypothesis and the way to test it is to look at the types of isotopes that are in that smoke. Now we know the military had planes up and we can also uh, assume that there were laboratories count, counting the material. And there's two xenon isotopes and depending on the ratio we can determine if it was a prompt criticality or not in that fuel pool. Uh, so the evidence is there, but uh, we're not getting it yet. But I would assume that our government has it. Well, thank you very much. And as more information becomes available, I'll keep you informed.